please welcome to the stage Fritz Demopoulos, CEO, Queen's Road Capital. <laughs> Good morning, Fritz. Good morning, Sue Hoon. How are you? Great, thanks. <laughs> Good. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to create this funnel, and then we're going to drill the questions down, OK? OK. So um, we're going to start off like high level Asia. All right, OK. And you know, we've talked a lot about this. Like, uh, you know, we've talked about Asia a long time before mm -hmm. and all that. So what are entrepreneurs or operating companies still not getting about Asia? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I would answer it two ways. Uh, there are things that companies do get about Asia. Um, there's a lot of consultants and advisors now. There's a lot of factual information that, that, uh, that a lot of entrepreneurs and operating companies that I meet in the region here in Europe very much understand about Asia. But maybe what they don't understand is, um, I like to describe it as more process things. Um, so, so, for example, when, when, when a company develops, you know, they do something called like product market fit, they do some R&D development, and then they execute, that's the second phase, and then the third phase is they harvest. That's pretty, pretty standard, and we hear about that all the time with startups. But in, in, in Asia, and I think in particular in China, we do see some differences. That development phase, that uh, product market fit, I, I think too many foreign companies think it's very short when it should be longer. It, it isn't just translating your service and trying to launch it in China, for example. It's spending a lot of time trying to understand the nuances of the consumer. And so I think one of the misunderstandings is companies um, don't understand how long it takes to figure out China market fit or Indonesia market fit or Japan market fit. Okay. And then at the same time, they misunderstand the execution phase. And as we all understand in Asia, and especially places like China and Japan and Korea, it's extremely competitive. And I think operating companies misunderstand that it's so competitive, it moves so fast, and they actually think that the execution phase takes maybe longer than it should, but the reality is, is once uh, competitors and local incumbents in China um, uh, figure out how their product works, product market fit, they're super aggressive and they execute much faster than what we've seen anywhere in the world. Okay. And then the last phase, harvest phase, it, it used to be once you figured out your product and you executed well, then maybe you can make some money. Um, but what we've seen is that harvest phase is actually much shorter than you think, unfortunately. And in, 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 in the reality is um, you probably have to kill your own product and actually start from the beginning again. Um, and there's this unending cycle of a little bit of creative destruction, product market fit, try to execute, and maybe you could reap some of the fruits of your success, but not too much, because if, if, if you actually harvest too much, Jack Ma or Pony Ma or some of these other entrepreneurs are just gonna right. take it from you. So, so, I mean, that's interesting, because you know, one of the things that I've also seen that companies do when they come to Asia is they also expect that the, the time that they're gonna get some returns is really quick, right? So they, they kind of give themselves a very short time and they want that return, but you know, the harvesting could actually take way longer. Like, you need to really till the soil much I mean, more than they do, right? Yeah, ex ex exactly, and, and, and this is what's tricky. So a, a company in Europe, they may have spent two years developing their product, just like you're supposed to do, um, and, and, and how they incentivize their development and engineering teams is different than when they try to harvest and execute. But, but, but what happens is uh, when you try to understand the market in, in, in Asia, uh, s s somehow operating companies, they start um, ex ex expecting people or, or, or kind of their on the ground staff to actually achieve the results um, while not recognizing that they have to go through that two year cycle just like they did here. Right. And, 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 and the compensation structures, the incentive structures are completely different for each of those phases. And so there's this massive misunderstanding. Right. So, I mean, you've had experience with startups in both Europe and Asia, uh, you know, you've invested in uh, both continents. What's one, what's one lesson or what one thing that European startups could learn from startup in Asia, like just one key factor? I, th I think the best companies in Europe and in Asia are just extremely focused and extremely relentless. And some of the companies I've invested in in Berlin and Barcelona and the UK and, and, and some other places, the, the companies that do the best are just super relentless and focused, just like in place. In, Okay. Frankly, just like in Asia. So there's a common, uh, common yeah. threat. Okay. Yeah. 
What do you think is the most misunderstood market in Asia? So I think that the highly dynamic markets that are changing very quickly are actually not that misunderstood, only because any time you're in a highly dynamic environment, there's all sorts of interesting opportunities to learn. Everyone's trying to learn, even the local players. And it's, it's, so my view is probably the, the, the harder markets to actually understand are those that are very well established. So places like Korea, Japan, Taiwan, I, I, th I think those markets are a little bit more difficult because they're established, the social structures are, are established, the back channels are established, and that just takes a little bit more time and, 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 and energy to kind of break through. All right. So ASEAN, again, you know, is the fifth largest economy, yet it's also underestimated. Uh, for, for companies wanting to tackle the A ASEAN market, which is Southeast Asia, what, what's one key piece of advice that you give them? Good luck. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, I would say that you need a senior level of commitment to the ASEAN region. So there's 600 million consumers. Most are under 30 years old, which is like the exact opposite of this continent. Um, savings rates, depending on the country, are decent. Uh, not like China, frankly, but decent. Um, and so there's a lot of room for optimism that, that companies can actually sell their products, engage in these markets. And, and the huge benefit of ASEAN is it's generally more open and, and, and not as closed as you know, their northern neighbor. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so to me, that's you know, super exciting. However, um, like any market in the world, this is a puzzle that has to be solved. And that just requires a commitment at the senior levels of any organization to have the patience to, to, to really try to solve that puzzle. Right. I mean, right now we're seeing amazing growth out of Vietnam and Philippines, actually, in terms of travel. So let's move to China. Everybody, you know, talks about China. Most exciting innovation you're seeing there? I mean, obviously, it's mobile payments and, you know, the cashless society. I, I was recently in a coffee shop in Shanghai, and, and I only had cash because, because, my, because my Alipay um, um, only works in Hong Kong and not in mainland China. And it was the weirdest thing was uh, the uh, coffee shop a proprietor just told me, sorry, like we don't take cash anymore. You just have to zap a QR code. And it was just the weirdest thing. And, okay. and so, I, so, so I couldn't pay for my coffee. So luckily he gave it to me. Right? <laughs> you um, didn't have to wash uh, the coffee cups for him. Yeah, I didn't have to wash. But, but just the, the, there's a massive revolution in what Tencent is doing with WePay and what Alibaba is doing with Alipay. I mean, I mean, those are the two big players. Yeah. And it's just massive cashless mobile payments and just, just going at light speed. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of also scaremongering about China, right? I mean, we, we read in the Western media and, and, you know, I was reading an article where it says, uh, in future, China will employ millions of American workers and dominate thousands of small communities all over the United States, you know, and then they throw in facts. So, so China, is it to be feared or is it to be embraced? What to fear and what to embrace? So my view on this is, um, yeah, I think I might agree with that a little bit. Um, um, I, I, I think that, um, and by the way, this is backed up by academic studies. Um, you, know, you know, we like, um, everyone wants the benefits of globalization. Things are cheaper, you can go to the Walmart or wherever, or the Metro or like the equivalent here and buy cheap, cheap stuff that was made in China, right? So we love globalization. Um, however, what we also want is local accountability, right? We want these large companies or, or these large um, you know, employers and, and of course economies to somehow be accountable to, to people in various markets. And what, we've, we, what, what we have seen, and again, this is, a, a, so, so th there was a co-study at Stanford and UCLA that has shown that countries that own their own um, financial infrastructure, their own media infrastructure, transportation in, in, in a few other areas, um, they tend to be more accountable to the local people. And you know, that's really, really important. And you know, that flies in the face, I think, of globalization a little bit. And you know, frankly, I mean, you think Zuckerberg really cares about what happens in Holland or Belgium or wherever, or, or the UK? He doesn't care. I mean, there's no accountability whatsoever in kind of, in, I think, in spite of what he says. And, and so, you know, there's this massive like tension going on where we all want the benefits of these global platforms 
and e-commerce and cheap products in China and places like that and everything Jack Ma is doing has been amazing for consumers. But at the same time, we do need some accountability and, uh, and, and you know, that's that natural tension. And like, I kind of feel that maybe I, I think consumers are recognizing you know, maybe it's shifting a little bit towards slightly less globalization and maybe more accountability to mm. um, so, kind of local people. So we as consumers should expect and demand local accountability from global companies, whether they come out of China or the US or Europe. I mean, so China, it should not be exceptionally singled out to say, you know, they're the rogues. I, again, that's my, I mean, like Zuckerberg's not Chinese. I mean, his wife is, but he yeah, isn't, right? Yeah, I he mean, speaks Mandarin. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I mean, this is, I, I think this is a global phenomenon and, mm. you know, um, and, and, and I think it's going to be tricky and, you know, and some of this, uh, you know, data privacy stuff we're seeing, you know, that's kind of addressing it in some ways, but there's a bigger issue and like when they teach, you know, like economics at, you know, the Rotterdam Business School or wherever, you know, I mean, everyone talks about, you know, everything that David Ricardo said about, you know, you know, a comparative advantage, everything is good, right? Globalization, economics is good, barriers are bad, right? And, but you know, maybe there's another way to think about it. And, and believe me, like I'm not a communist whatsoever, um, but I do think that, you know, some local accountability, I, I, th I think is better, or what, whether that relates to what, you know, Google and Facebook are doing, whether that relates to maybe what some of the massive e-commerce players here, like Booking.com is doing, frankly, um, or, or, or maybe Jack Ma, I'm, I'm, you know, really out of China, right? And we have to be just very careful. I mean, can consumers rally around and demand that? I mean, that's like saying, let's have, you know, con uh, consumers insist on green products and organic products. Yeah. Sure, I think that's great, but you know, I th I th and, and I think that's part of it, but you know, maybe, Maybe there's some smart uh, regulatory issues as well that uh, maybe that can be brought up. Right. So they say uh, Tencent will sh shake the world. Tencent's ambitions will shake the world. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of Tencent in spite of losing... I mean, the company's so big that uh, their share price is down 17%, which accounts for $95 billion in market cap. <laughs> I mean, that's how big this company is, right? Um, um, but... But obviously, with mobile payments and the and, and kind of the WeChat marketplace, I mean, Tencent will be a phenomenal um, distribution platform, really for our industry. Yeah. And and it's going to be great, especially for the 1.45 billion Chinese and mm. people in Southeast Asia who are very much using, you know, the, I think the WeChat yeah. platform as I well. I mean, we, we've seen some startups from Asia just building their entire business on the WeChat. Uh, platform. So, C Trip or Meituan? Well, I mean, I'm a shareholder of um, C Trip, and so whilst uh, I, I completely, it, I mean, admire Wang Shen, the founder of Meituan, I, I do um, think, you know, C Trip is a juggernaut that is just keeps moving and it's, it's an amazing company. Okay, so we move on to industry stuff, so let's uh, keep the answer short. Global elephants or Asian tigers, who will win? Mostly Asian tigers. We've seen it in Japan, Rakuten, Jalan. Um, Shibata-san is in the audience with, you know, a Venture Republic. Um, you know, they do exceptionally well in Japan. Mm. Meituan and Sea Trip are killing it in China. Um, we see maybe in Southeast Asia, sure, we have WeGo and, you know, Be My Guest and um, Agoda are doing well, but you know, Booking.com seems to be getting some traction, and Agoda as well, and, and okay. some other. So, so who is the industry's out of the box enemy? Is it Amazon? Is it Google? Is it Alibaba? So we know that Google is, I, I think, an enemy. I, I think we're going to recognize that um, maybe Amazon will, will also be one. Okay, and of course, I have to bring in blockchain, right? So delivery of dreams or nightmare in the making. Hype in the making, right? Hype in the making, okay. Right. All right, what's the dumbest thing that entrepreneurs do? Now we focus on your investments. What's the dumbest thing entrepreneurs do? I think the dumbest thing entrepreneurs do is maybe they listen to too many voices, including their investors, okay. as opposed to listening to their internal voice. Okay. What's the dumbest thing that VCs do? And then the opposite, you know, the dumbest thing VCs do is they think everyone should listen to them. <laughs> what's, the num what's the number one thing an investor and a founder need to agree on? 
I mean, it's, it's mutual respect, right? I mean, if a founder has an idea or a direction that he or she wants to take the business, an investor needs to respect the founder enough to understand why does he or she want to do that. And at the same time, if, if the VC is a little bit concerned or raises an eyebrow, the founder needs to respect the VC enough to say, why is that VC doing that? So okay. mutual respect. Your best investment? Other than China, I suppose. Your best investment. Yeah, you know, marrying my wife, uh, Chunar, and um, I mean, I'm super excited about my friends in Berlin, you know, with um, Get Your Guide, an amazing company, and I learn a lot from those guys. Okay, so Lise, why did you decide to invest in a European tours and activities player versus someone closer to home in Asia? You know, um, I was just so impressed with the, you know, the founding the team. team. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. I mean, we always invest in teams, and I mean, I mean, these founders were just, a, I mean, ex 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 exceptional, and mm. some of the best founders and entrepreneurs that I that I've ever met. And so, your worst investment? Uh, so I invested in a uh, ride-hailing company that failed. Um, but this was before DD launched, actually. So it was actually very early. So too early. Um, um, and you know, many of and I, I know there's some VCs in the audience too, and um, and I, I think they'd agree that most of the time we rarely make a strategic error in, an, in our investments. It's usually we pick the wrong team, and we had the right strategy. Ride hailing is going to make a lot of sense. Taxi hailing services. China, it's going to be amazing. I mean, the traffic sucks, it's amazing, but we just, we, we just backed the wrong horse. Okay, so now let's go to sci-fi, our favorite topic at the moment, your new startup, Melon, uh, sci-fi event. So William Gibson set his sci-fi fiction in Tokyo. Which Asian city or culture is currently blowing your mind? Um, which culture is blowing my mind? Um, I, th I think some of the subdivisions of Hong Kong, like Wan Chai, mm -hmm. you know, that's you know, like the, the world's most uh, in, in Causeway Bay, which is I think a hundred thousand people per very dense, densely like, populated. Yep. Yeah, like hundred meters or something like that. It's just this amazingly densely populated place. Okay. And you know, that's the future. But but but, but luckily, Hong Kong makes it work. Yeah. What can startups learn from sci-fi? You know, sci-fi writers, they take facts and technology and they try to extrapolate developments into the future. Uh, so, uh, so Andre from um, Amadeus Capital was talking about this last night, mm. how um, you know, these amazing sci-fi writers are actually scientists who understand what's happening today and somehow extrapolate into the future. And I, I think as entrepreneurs, it's the same thing. We see facts. We're here at Focus Right Europe. We're meeting interesting entrepreneurs. People are talking about concepts and ideas. And then we try to extrapolate and understand how will that develop in a few years' time. And you know what? Can we build a business around that? Okay, now we go last two minutes on your personal stuff. Uh, if you could go back to any point in your history and do things differently, when, when would that be and what would you do differently? I think uh, when I was running Chunar, my co-founder and I had a healthy disrespect, unfortunately, for the HR function. We used to think this was just an admin hassle that was under finance. Um, over the years, and uh, did we finally realize that the human resource function is extremely strategic and the most important function in the company? We just didn't get it, and we were too arrogant about it. And and so, if if I could go back, I would elevate the HR function, invest in the best HR staff I could find on day one, just so we can build a, I mean, I thought we had a great team at Chunar, but could we build an even more exceptional team? Okay. So what is your dream job? Equity analyst, chef, talk show host, or a sci-fi writer? A talk show host is great <laughs> because we're constantly extracting information from the external environment. And you know, what person who was curious wouldn't want to do that? I mean, any curious person would love that. Okay, right. so you told your daughter, Emma, this was at the opening of Melon, and you told your daughter, books are your most powerful weapons, right? So what book have you most recently read that's turning into your most powerful weapon right now? 
there's a few people, I, we, we, we talked about this actually yesterday, that there's actually a few people who have read the same book. I mean, Principles by Ray Dalio is just a phenomenal book. I mean, he's one of the top hedge fund managers in the world, or maybe the largest hedge fund. Um, and, you know, that book is just uh, amazing. And he just has a new way and, and, and really like a fresh way of thinking about how to make decisions, how to capitalize on our strengths, how to work with other people. It's just a great book. I'd recommend it to anybody. Fantastic. Please join me in thanking Fritz Demopoulos. Thank you. Thank you, Fritz. All right, thank you.